All right. For our second morning session, it is a pleasure to have Mike Douglas from the Simon Center in Stony Brook University. He's going to tell us about mathematical landscapes and string theory. Uh, thank you. Uh, th thank the organizers for bringing together such an interesting group of people and, and for the invitation to speak. So I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to talk about a uh, different set of uh, problems that, uh, again, several speakers will, will discuss in context of machine learning. And uh, what characterizes them is that they are, the input is, 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 is mathematics, meaning that these are natural data sets. So we usually think of images or something that uh, came out of the real world or the social world. Now, if we went and uh, found uh, aliens someplace, of course, they would not have uh, MNIST or CIFAR or any of these data sets, but they might well have the uh, data sets that uh, I'll talk about uh, here. In fact, a few of them I would guarantee that uh, they would have. And uh, so that's uh, one aspect of uh, the interest of this. And uh, so the other talks probably will be more specific to problems that arise from string theory, so I wanted to set that in a broader context of, of problems that come out of uh, mathematics. And uh, not to talk about ML, but to talk about challenges for ML and AI. OK. So uh, I thought to set the uh, you know, stage uh, to try to define mathematics, and there are some entertaining definitions. And uh, one that uh, mentioned the word uh, patterns is uh, by someone named uh, Sawyer, who was at Dartmouth. And uh, this is certainly uh, suggestive for us. We're trying to uh, get computers to detect patterns. Now, there's a flaw already in this definition from the start that <clears throat> shows that the author's not a computer scientist. You know, how could you possibly study all patterns? You know, that, would take, uh, that would not be efficient. And uh, perhaps uh, more to the point was this much earlier famous quote of uh, Poincaré that uh, mathematics is taking things that superficially look different and finding the commonalities and, in fact, uh, giving them the same name. So <clears throat> really, the core of mathematics is not so much to find patterns, although it is that, but it's to, to realize which patterns are important to uh, study in uh, depth. And uh, so uh, one of the most uh, ubiquitous patterns, and uh, of course, uh, Taco Cohen used this quite extensively, it was the foundation of his uh, talk, is the uh, group, you know, the group of symmetries of a, a mathematical object set. And uh, so this is, a, again, a well-developed topic in computational mathematics, and I'm going to try to discuss it as a mathematical landscape a little bit, because I think here is a source, fruitful source of uh, benchmark problems for any, any claim to having general ways of detecting patterns and working with them. And uh, then we'll move on to some concrete examples in uh, string theory. OK, so uh, people here know the uh, group concept. Again, it was uh, used extensively in the uh, first talk, just again to set the stage. Uh, <clears throat> a natural group that we're all familiar with is the uh, isometries of a d-dimensional Euclidean space. So we have a rotations, n equals a d, or, and uh, we have uh, translations. And uh, then there can be uh, interesting uh, subgroups of that uh, continuous group with parameters. So uh, the uh, space group of a crystal are the uh, discrete transformations that uh, preserve the uh, crystal. There will be translations that preserve the last structure. There will also be some subgroup of the rotation group. And these have been classified. I think there are 278 or so of these. And uh, again, much used in uh, physics, uh, many other subjects. And uh, again, this is so ubiquitous that uh, it comes up if, when you discuss almost any mathematical structure. And of course, the origin of this in mathematics was, was not from this. It was from the structure of the problem of solving algebraic equations, which leads to the uh, Galois group. And uh, so, so it's been, you know, since the late 19th century, one of the very central problems of mathematics. And uh, <clears throat> so classification, of course, is one of the uh, primary aspects of that. And uh, so there are 
finite dimensional simple Lie groups, which I'll mention briefly, and classification to the finite simple groups. Okay. So what, what does this word uh, simple mean? It uh, is a precise sense in which one can build up the general object as some combination of the uh, simple ones. And uh, to be more specific here, there should be no non-trivial quotient group or no, no, no non-trivial normal subgroup. So the space group that I described, just to have that in mind, is not simple because the translations are a, a normal subgroup of the space group, and uh, the rotations are a, a quotient group. Okay, and so uh, every every group, and certainly every finite group, every, you know, every group within broad you know <coughs> restrictions, can be built up from these simple groups. That's one way of breaking down the problem. And uh, then, given the groups, it can act on other objects in many ways, and one can classify these to in a precise uh, sense. <coughs> Okay, so, so we have these uh, powerful classification theorems for these uh, simple cases. And uh, so to talk about the uh, continuous case, and uh, I'll mention this partly because this is really the bread and butter. If you're a, a theoretical particle physicist, you know, certain other parts of uh, theoretical physics, you know, this is the thing that you find yourself using all the time. And uh, there were physical reviews back before... Uh, Everything was on the web, just lists of group data and uh, you know, tables of representations, you know, Slansky et al. People you know, of a certain age will know what I'm talking about. And uh, not only is uh, this done, it's actually fairly uh, simple and uh, pretty. And there are these uh, diagrams that uh, have a simple definition that express the classification result. So that's starting to be the sort of, of landscape. I mean, I'm going to say more about this uh, term landscape, which is not a, a standard one in mathematics, but uh, to say that there's a set of objects where the definitions are simple and then some sort of non-trivial classification and relations between them come out. This was certainly not something you would have just guessed writing on a napkin, although it didn't take that hard to find. Okay, so now the finite simple groups, uh, groups that, uh, so we have the platonic, uh, you know, the five, you know, <coughs> you know, subgroups of uh, SO3 in three dimensions, and uh, general finite groups broken down into these finite simple groups is really a landmark of uh, mathematics. And uh, the original proof of this was a group of maybe, uh, I don't know, 30 people and 10,000 of pages. And they're working on a simplified version, which is still going to be over 5,000 pages long. And uh, you know, the top level statement is not that much longer than the uh, top level statement for the uh, Lie algebras. But even defining these objects is a lot of work. So there's this famous example of the uh, monster group. So the largest of groups that does not fall into some sort of an infinite uh, family with uh, roughly 10 to the 54 elements and really no simple description. So this is one of the outstanding problems in that field. Now, you know, as a string theorist, you know, we all have a special liking for this group. It clearly has deep relations to string theory that we don't quite understand. Okay, so, so that starts to be what I mean by a mathematical landscape. You know, the definition of group, you all know it. It's just trivial. The definition of a simple group, really not any more complicated. And then this uh, very intricate classification comes out. And uh, so uh, how do we, you know, how do, how do we, why do we believe that? And how do we work with uh, that, that very complicated set of uh, data? Okay, so again, you know, people have been working with this. They had to work with this for computers, with computers since the start. You know, the, the construction of the monster group started out with a lot of computer calculations to get matrix representations and so forth. And uh, so far, it's, it's a topic for specialists. And uh, it's something of such general utility. You know, again, you know, this should be more accessible. This is already a question. You know, how can AI help us mathematicians, mathematical scientists work with this? Okay, so now one interesting example of, of a success, I would say, of machine learning here. So you might remember a couple of years ago in Northeastern, in, 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 the, in the discussion, we, we discussed a question of if, if we're asking reinforcement learning to find non-trivial solutions for string vacua, maybe we should try it on simpler problems like the uh, Rubik's Cube. You know, can a uh, 
you know, can a machine automatically solve a Rubik's cube and learn to solve that? And at the time, it had not been done. But in the meantime, it was done. It was done almost a, a year ago by a group at uh, Irvine. And uh, that's a pretty paper, which is worth reading. It has a, a couple of nice additions to the, you know, it's a pretty standard reinforcement learning thing, but with a couple of nice additions to how it learns. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into it, but uh, you know, that's an interesting example of reinforcement learning for a particular group, you know, this, this symmetry group of the uh, Rubik's Cube. And uh, as such, this is a problem with a vast number of generalizations, the infinite set of uh, groups. So one's more, to be more precise, there's some set of generators. So for the Rubik's Cube, you turn a face, and that, you know, by combining those operations, those generators, you produce the whole group. So you want a graph where every edge is a move on some sort of a state space. And uh, so here, the state space could just be group elements, the regular representation, and the move is left multiplication by a generator, or it's inverse. And uh, so you got this huge graph, which you don't start out knowing. And the question is, can the machine, can some particular algorithm learn to find the identity efficiently from uh, a, a random starting point? And I think this is a problem with enough structure that uh, as a benchmark, this would be more interesting and more canonical than a lot of the things people look at. Okay, but it's sort of a landscape problem because now we're talking about many groups one at a time, but uh, then we'd like to really explore the set of groups, and I'll, I'll come back to what I mean by that. Okay, so, so, so moving on, uh, the uh, mathematical landscapes, of course, include the uh, solutions of fundamental theories where there's really some sort of precise mathematical definition of the theory, which can come out of many different formalisms. And uh, now we can start classifying and relating its uh, solutions. I think uh, any, any reasonable person would say that the most important class of these to our present um, knowledge of science, and perhaps forever, is the uh, landscape of quantum chemistry. So solutions of the uh, Schrodinger equation for the electrons, and then some sort of semi-classical approximation usually gets, you know, gets you rested away in terms of the uh, nuclei. And uh, so uh, that's a mathematical landscape, given some collection of nuclei and the uh, balancing set of electrons. What are the solutions of this equation, which seems to be a pretty good, not exact, but a pretty good approximation to what those uh, quantum molecules are in the uh, real world. OK, and of course, uh, people work on that. It's, it's a very complicated and very challenging problem. But of course, we do have a lot of data. And this is, a, again, a prime application in machine learning. This is a landscape, but now you could question the, uh, the term mathematical in the sense that uh, mathematics, again, although it's true, this, this guy is something that the aliens would also have. This guy has so many special features, and you probably really do need to put in a lot of non ab initio, a lot of facts about the real world to know what are the interesting problems. And so uh, you could certainly debate whether chemistry is actually mathematics and you know, say, well, not really. OK, but, but string theory, at least as far as we understand it so far, I would say is much closer to mathematics. And that may just be because that's how we study it. Those are the tools we have. But there are many arguments that uh, at least uh, give hope in that direction, that understanding string vacua ab initio. We can't write down the equation like this. So that's a, certainly a huge gap in our understanding. But that will happen in due course. And we have many techniques for working with uh, solutions. And uh, then there are arguments which I can discuss privately as to why ab initio string theory is a more promising project than ab initio quantum chemistry, which would be a very difficult project. OK, so I'm not going to really give any long introduction to string theory, because that would use up uh, half of my talk. And uh, hopefully, many of you have uh, heard it. Again, I'm happy to talk about it privately. But the, the present status of things is that uh, we have this good theory of, of quantum gravity, which we don't fully, but we partially understand. We have arguments for over 30 years now that by compactifying the extra dimensions, we can get out the standard model and the physics that we see. And uh, we now understand things well enough to see that uh, not only is there no unique solution that comes out, there's really a, a combinatorially large number of solutions that come out. And there's even 
arguments that, that this was kind of inevitable, that people that wrote about the anthropic principle made before these arguments and you know, contemporaneously, independently of the string theory arguments. And so we'd like to really understand this set of uh, solutions. Okay, so again, just to uh, <clears throat> you know, put the obligatory picture up there, we are postulating some extra dimensional manifold M and we are postulating some extra structure, which I'll be vague about in this talk, uh, V. And uh, at least at the present uh, level of understanding, we can make a list of these guys. They have to satisfy many constraints. I'll mention a couple. And uh, each one leads to some predictions for what we observe, and we just like to have some sense. You know, We could classify, you know, we could try to list guys and get our evidence from that, we could try to come up with conditions that say, well, you know, this type of prediction can never come out because it violates some sort of general principle. Those are all potentially valid approaches. OK, so uh, what do we know about this extra dimensional manifold M? OK, well, <clears throat> pretty much always, if you know, it, it satisfies the vacuum Einstein equation, it is Ricci flat. And uh, the argument for that is that the curvature is a term in the vacuum energy, and that had better be small. And in fact, since the, you can show one-dimensional grounds that the extra dimensions are small, this energy will be one over that uh, to a power. And so that has really better be zero. OK, so we need to solve Ricci flat. And the simplest way is to have a flat manifold, like Euclidean space, like a, a quotient of Euclidean space by a lattice, which defines a, a torus. And so these are definitely good compactifications. In fact, they're, they're so good that they're so highly symmetric that uh, they cannot describe our universe. Okay, but uh, then early on, people observed that there were more symmetries that you could uh, quotient by. So you could start with this torus and try to quotient by the identification vector x in the extra dimensions with uh, minus the vector x, so just a reflection about the uh, origin. And then although that acts with fixed points, those fixed points can be OK in string theory. And you get what's called an uh, orbifold. Okay? And then you, you, if you could proceed to consider this, you'll find that, in fact, you can't literally do this, but you can do something very much like it with uh, groups of the uh, coordinates. Okay, And so that was, of course, developed over the years. And there's this uh, fairly well-studied class of uh, T6 mod Z2 cross Z2 compactifications of the uh, type uh, 2A string theory. And uh, a fair amount of work has been done on characterizing the landscape of its solutions. And uh, you know, again, time and interest doesn't permit giving details. So let me just give you kind of the flavor of that. So uh, we're postulating brains that embed in three-dimensional hypersurfaces in the uh, torus underlying this thing. And those, some useful a subclass, the ones we want are characters by six integers, the winding numbers around each of the uh, six axes of this uh, torus. And then we have various consistency conditions, some from uh, absolute consistency, some from uh, supersymmetry of the resulting theory, which are linear constraints on this uh, set of integer data, but not linear in the original variables, linear in some cubic uh, monomials constructed from them. OK, so we could list those. There's a finite number of constraints on a finite number of these choices. And then here are the predictions we're trying to get out. So the basic one is just the uh, multiplicity of each type of brain. And that turns into the rank of its gauge group, a gauge group that we could, in principle, see in uh, four dimensions. And the standard model gives us a very definite target to shoot for, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. There's a uh, matter content which has to do with intersections between brains and is easily computed from the uh, numbers I just gave. And again, very, very clear target, which I didn't write out, but uh, you know, very well known to uh, shoot for, with one free parameter, the number of generations of quarks and leptons, you know, three in our world, but not necessarily three. And uh, then exotic matter, which doesn't fit into this pattern with many bounds. And those are interesting if, if they appear. Those are things that we probably could detect someday at uh, accelerator. Okay, so, Given the setup we've just described, the kind of questions we can ask is, well, out of this huge space of possibilities, which has been shown to be a finite, well, what fraction of them realize this? You know, with, with what distribution of that? And what's the distribution of the extra matter? OK, so, so that's a pretty well-posed mathematical landscape that uh, does give us interesting physical claims. And it's 
one of a uh, somewhat bigger family. I'll talk about Claude Diaz, and one can generalize this problem to some extent to uh, that. Okay, so, so without having spelled it out, you can believe we have this complicated combinatorial optimization problem. I list uh, sets of these uh, six vectors of integers. We want to satisfy the uh, constraints. So the simplest way to divide a dual would be to just random walk through a state space where we uh, change individual n, m data and uh, start trying, you know, counting. Maybe these ones enforce the constraints. Maybe we have some sort of heuristics to uh, get the constraints. But uh, now's the point where the problem is well enough to find that you can <clears throat> try some, whatever you like for combinatorial optimization, in particular uh, reinforcement learning. If you have a space like this with uh, a very general kind of structure, constraints, and some sort of an objective function, that sounds promising. And indeed, uh, Halverson, Nelson, and Ruas, I think we'll be discussed later, have shown that reinforcement learning really works much better than the uh, random walk for uh, this kind of problem. And uh, so that's an example of a mathematical landscape of uh, string theory. And uh, so then, well, one can ask physical questions. And in particular, in physics, not only does one have these vacuum, one has really transitions that are allowed in cosmology between these vacuum, which we know something about. We don't know a huge amount about. And uh, to the extent we know about that, then uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting then to study the problem using those transitions for the uh, learning agent. And then you might, if you're very optimistic, hope that features of, of, of that dynamics, or, yeah, that exploration of the space, actually do say something about which vacua are more likely to describe our universe or uh, less likely. You know, again, it's all very speculative to think that a particular reinforcement learning algorithm is picking up anything about quantum cosmology. But this is all so speculative, we need to generate ideas. And this is at least a source of well-defined ideas in that uh, domain. OK, uh, I'll continue unless there are questions about that. So uh, OK, so, so that's only, we believe, one small subset of the solutions. And uh, then there are various other ways of getting Ritchie flame manifolds, which require quite a bit more mathematics to understand. Okay, the Calavial threefolds, the G2 manifolds, the elliptic fiber Calavial fourfolds for F theory. And uh, just again to give the basic definition, we could take complex projective four space, you know, a priori of four complex or eight real dimensional space, and then impose one complex equation. So the solutions to this equation are a three complex dimensional space, which in this particular case, and for generic polynomials, is actually a smooth manifold. It turns out to be a perfectly valid space that has a Ritchie flat metric that you can't write down analytically, but it's been proven by uh, Yao. And, uh, so this has been the starting point for, again, a huge amount of work in uh, string compactification. And it's just amazing how far the mathematics allows you to go in terms of computing predictions for this. OK, so I'm going to briefly describe the generalization of this to a toric hypersurfaces. And uh, rather than, again, try to give you the mathematics, just to say now you have to broaden your, your point of view a bit. But once you do that, there is this pretty subclass of manifolds, which are not Calaviers, but they're like generalizations of this uh, CP4, which is positively curved. And these things, in a sense, are vague sets, are, are positively curved, the ones that we're going to want to use. And uh, so this is a fairly simple relation between combinatorial data, these uh, fans on the uh, integer lattices, and complex manifolds. So this represents uh, CP2. And the fact that uh, three vectors and the three vectors all add up to zero translates directly into the statement that there are three coordinates. And then there's one identification that when we multiply by it, all the coordinates by the same power of lambda, we identify those points. And so that can be turned into a general rule that will take a large class of diagrams like this and turn them into complex manifolds. OK. And uh, so just to be a little more concrete, this is from a paper by uh, Yang Hui and collaborators. These are a particular subset of these things in two dimensions. I'm about to say what reflexive means and why we 
care, but uh, this includes the guys that I was talking about, except that these are the polytopes generated by uh, you know, vertices on these uh, rays. And uh, so uh, what does reflexive mean? Okay, well, reflexive means that there's a uh, dual in the standard linear algebra sense to each of these uh, polytopes. And so the dual of this guy is that. The dual of this guy is that. Some guys are self-dual and so forth. And uh, then the mathematician Batterev, soon after this idea of mirror symmetry was proposed, gave this as a possible explanation of mirror symmetry. So the, the claim is that uh, if you satisfy this reflexivity condition, then there's some polynomial in this variety for which the hypersurface, the solutions, if that polynomial equals zero, is a Calabi Bial manifold. And then that reflexivity condition tells you that they'll always come in pairs like this. This one has a Calabi Bial, that one has a Calabi Bial. And so you can do the same classification in four dimensions instead of two, and you get some diagram like this with 400 million entries. And that database exists. That is the kreutzer skarka database of a reflexive uh, four topes. And uh, now this is half of a diagram where I've plotted the most basic topological invariants of those 400 million points. And the other half of the diagram is the near image of this one, guaranteed by the construction that we just gave. And uh, so this was their survey of uh, Calabia toric, a hypersurface Calabia fourfold. Okay. Okay, so, so they were inspired by mirror symmetry and they wanted to check that out, but they discovered, of course, much more. And uh, one of the most uh, you know, elementary, from some point of view, things they discovered is that there's this shape which goes like this at the boundary. And if I complete out to, with the mirror image, it's kind of like a shield on a police badge or something. And so people call this a shield. And uh, you know, that's, that's an interesting thing, you know, that, that, was, uh, that was discovered. You know, you can try to explain it, but uh, that's the sort of thing that you could clearly try to explore a set like this and, and identify using machine learning. So you could ask the same question for uh, five tubs or seven tubs or whatever. How do I characterize that boundary? Presumably there's a boundary because in every dimension it's finite, but is there any way I can say what that boundary looks like, you know? And uh, so there's a, there's a challenge. You know, that's something that we're very unlikely to solve without computer search and uh, machine learning and clever sampling and so forth. OK, so uh, I believe to some extent you can understand this boundary independently in terms of uh, the structure of elliptically fiber Calabi. That's a different uh, version of this. We should ask uh, Waddy Taylor about this, who studied this quite a bit. But uh, in any case, uh, that's not how this was discovered. And it would be interesting to know in higher dimensions if there's a similar relation and what that boundary looks like. OK, so that's the set aspect. And now I, I mentioned the fact that you know, any kind of search of the space is going to involve transitions and uh, move through the space of possibilities. And there are natural transitions in toric geometry that involve basically subdividing the uh, faces of the uh, polytope in simple ways. And uh, those are the mathematically and physically natural trans transitions. They correspond to things called blow-ups and extremal transitions, which have the physics interpretation. And those are definitely the transitions we would like to understand for purposes of quantum cosmology, exploring the space. Cosmology is somehow exploring the space of possible vacua. OK, so just to say a couple words to conclude, let's come back to this set of finite groups. And uh, so those, you know, Calabial starts to be a, a, a broad a question of somewhat broad mathematical importance. And uh, Mike, that's a question. Yeah, yeah. please. Sorry, I, I, was, I just wanted to ask uh, whether those transitions you showed are rapidly mixing. Because that's uh, from the computer science point of view. That is an excellent question. And I, does anybody know if that's been studied? What was, can you say it one more time? Yeah, let's come back to it. So, but I, Rapidly I, mixing was the yeah, word. Yeah, that, 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 that is, of course, the, the right question to ask. And I, I suspect it has not been answered in this literature. OK, so, so finite groups. Okay, could we study the uh, set of finite groups in anything like this uh, modality? OK, so could we postulate? I mean, of course, the finite groups exist. You know, probably restricting the finite simple groups gives us something which is too special and not connected. But is there, again, any kind of state action network with the states being finite groups 
the actions being natural relations, perhaps group extensions, perhaps some sort of other natural relations between the groups, which again gives us a nice network, which is rapidly mixing would be the ideal. And uh, so uh, can we postulate that? Does that exist in the literature? Of course, this is an infinite set, you know, as opposed to those finite sets. But you can say, let's, let's uh, you know, put an exponential uh, penalty to the uh, groups of higher and higher order or some other complexity measure, and then we can explore that space. And uh, then suppose we're exploring it. Well, what do we want to do? We would like some sort of exploration, ideally, that uh, helped us with this classification, which as things stand is, is you know, 5,000 pages long. So could we write a short you know, reinforcement learning program that produced a short list that actually included all these finite simple groups, you know, that uh, explores <clears throat> at least efficiently enough to produce them all in a finite time, and even better, show that uh, you give some sort of evidence that it's found the uh, whole list. Okay, and uh, my guess would be that, yes, you could write such a program. I, was, well, I have no idea how to do it. And the program would be much less than 5,000 pages long. It would give you quite a bit of the information of those 5,000 pages running that program. And uh, then somehow combining these facts with, uh, you, you would get statements of facts which are not of the sort that human mathematicians like, very, very complicated, you know, implicit constructions of groups, but uh, the sort that uh, computers might like to work with that would turn into another style of proof of this classification. OK, so, uh, so just again to summarize that, that, that comment, uh, there are intricate mathematical structures, which we can call landscapes, which uh, to some extent clearly can be understood without a computer. But uh, the computer is a great help. And in fact, possibly in many examples, a <clears throat> is, 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 is a more useful. You know? so, so having a short but conceptually complicated description of such a thing is, is, is valuable. But perhaps having a conceptually simple you know, program that generates a complicated logical description is also useful. And another example of that would be the graphs that come up in the proof of the four color theorem. OK, this is a comment at the end. This is another random set looking set of you know, maybe uh, 600 and the improved version of this proof of graphs that you have to prove can be four colored. And then there's a sort of arbitrary rules that the authors had to come up with. How do you reduce to this set of 600 graphs? Now, if the computer could come up with those rules, this is the, the set of these graphs is in some sense a mathematical landscape as well. Then that's another model of this paradigm. How do you get simple proofs of intricate, you know, that apply to intricate uh, structures? And again, you would want uh, to combine machine learning with some sort of theorem verification to really make an impact with that. So I'll stop there. All right. Thanks, Mike, for the wonderful talk. We have uh, five or ten minutes for questions. Uh, what questions do you have? Uh, sure. Uh, what was meant with rapid phase transitions? Uh, uh, rapid mixing. So there's rapid this. Mix. Uh, so, what did you mean with rapid mixing? Okay, I mean, I mean, the the basic thing would be that uh, from these networks you could derive a, a Markov process where, uh, say, the you have you have edges and the probability of taking a transition is one over the number of edges. So you're making all transitions with equal probability. And now you can ask, uh, you know, what is the uh, time to approach the uniform, so you started at the point, what's the time to approach a uniform distribution, which has to do with the uh, dominant eigenvalue of that matrix. And so you want that to be uh, fast. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, first, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you discussed uh, a little bit of verification, exploration. Do you have a vision on how, say, discoveries could be somehow automated? I mean, within, uh, I mean, you know, getting back some info, you know, very non-trivial information that. Well, it is such a broad prospect. Again, I mean, uh, people have been making computer-aided discoveries. I think the prospect of significant discoveries made purely by the computer without human help is is, is still somewhat distant. We shouldn't focus on that. So. It's, it's more a matter of enabling us as humans to uh, recognize patterns which in themselves are too intricate you know, for us to work with alone. So that's my, that's my vision at the present. Yeah, sorry, just a quick comment following up on, on Mike's question and then Sven's question. Um, so I think 
there is good evidence that it's rapidly mixing from the point of view of elliptic vibrations, which you alluded to. Basically, you can do blow-ups and blow-downs. And actually, we did some Monte Carlo studies for four-folds looking at the bases, where it looks like at least the bases look mixing for three-folds and four-folds. I'd be happy to chat with people more if they're interested. All okay, right, good. Other questions for Mike? Another up, up here. Oh, sorry. No. Thank you for your beautiful talk. Um, your idea of this uh, group, you know, machine learning group is actually wonderful. I'm just in the process of wrapping up a, um, a draft with uh, Minyon Kim. So one of the experiments we did was precisely to take the first, say, 1,000 groups, a finite groups, and see whether some neural network can recognize whether it's simple or not. And the accuracy is actually pretty high. We're talking about something like 90%. And we say yes and yes and no. I said, we have no idea why it's record. So oh, yeah. we feed in the Kelly right. table of right. the group and just from the Kelly data, which is not obvious from a right. point of view of group theory. You can't right. quite, right. the algorithm right. is not, but it's just, it's predicting this kind of simple. Oh, so it's kind of interesting. So. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> Other questions? Uh, so you had the, on, the, on one slide that uh, uh, quantum chemistry might be kind of boring in terms of mathematics. But well, it's can not come boring. Out. It's a very the, interesting the, question. Oh, <laughs> but whether it's mathematics, yes, it's yeah. a philosophical issue you could debate. Yeah. So uh, in what sense, can you elaborate a little bit more? Because you, you had a comment on like well, string theory the, could the lead to more things. Are, okay. So now we have to talk about the aliens that live in some other you know, branch of the multiverse. You know? So would they care about the solutions to that? You know, probably not. But would they care about the list of the finite uh, groups? Yes. All right, maybe I have one more question before we wrap up. So uh, we have a very broad community here, which is wonderful and part of the fun of this meeting. If there were sort of one or two challenges that you might characterize as some of our big challenges in string theory that might be amenable to techniques from data science or ML, what might those be? Uh, why don't you, because we're going to have discussion sessions later, why don't you give me a little more time to reflect? And we can we'll do. Discussion yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's thank Mike one more time. So for our final talk of the morning session, it's wonderful to have Koji Hashimoto here, who's going to tell us about holography, matter, and deep learning. Thank you. Uh, I'm Koji from Osaka. Nice to meet you. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Jim and the organizers for inviting me to this wonderful place. Uh, my uh, work here is to introduce you a brief summary of what has been uh, done for uh, condensed matter physics and also holography uh, using machine learning techniques. But, uh, well, uh, I, I just th thought that it's, it's boring to uh, give you the list of uh, what has been done. So uh, I'd, I'd like to present my view uh, how why, why these are kind of uh, connected with, with each other. Uh, the point is that, in fact, uh, I want to make an, an emphasis on uh, the importance of networks. Um, so uh, we in uh, physics uh, used uh, a particular kinds of networks for describing, uh, for example, wave function of con uh, condensed matter physics or uh, in, in, uh, also in uh, gravity. And those networks have a particular form, uh, which are, of course, different from uh, neural networks which you use. But uh, in some sense, they are very similar to each other. And I'd like to use uh, these techniques of uh, deep learning and machine learning to uh, this condensed matter physics and quantum gravity uh, to solve the grand questions there. So first, in section zero, I'd like to make a brief review of uh, what kind of networks have been used in uh, condensed matter and uh, quantum gravity. And also, uh, then, uh, as a concrete example, I'd like to show you uh, my work, uh, which has been done with uh, Akio, uh, who is sitting there, collaborator, um, about uh, uh, how to implement uh, ADS safety or holography, uh, a version of quantum gravity to deep learning. And uh, this particular uh, thing has been successful in my sense to give a nice prediction about uh, quark matter. 
And so uh, the use of deep learning not just a way of uh, optimizing some, uh, some, uh, some, some physical observables, but use it as a network. Uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, I'd like to stress that uh, it, uh, it, 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 it's giving an interesting physics. OK, so let me start with section uh, zero. So on your left, uh, I summarized uh, what kind of wave functions have, has been used in condensed matter. Here's, uh, so these two are, are the conventional one, ones. So matrix product states, tensor network states, in particular MERA, the multi-scale entanglement renormalization and that's. And these, so, so all of these I will uh, briefly review. And uh, these years, uh, we have a nice uh, 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 new ansatz which is based on neural network, neural network states. Uh, uh, the first one is Boltzmann machine, the other is uh, the, the fa sa famous field world states. And on your right, we have uh, quantum gravity. So in view of quantum gravity, of course, we have uh, this uh, string theory uh, motivated uh, holographic principle, ADS-CFT correspondence, which is a major subject in uh, string theory. But in addition to that, uh, as for network, uh, con network is concerned, uh, uh, we have to remember that what has been done for quantum gravity is uh, this regex calculus. So let me start with uh, your left-hand side, these things. So I go uh, with uh, by one by one. So, so what is the uh, grand challenge in condensed matter physics? Of course, uh, you have to find, so, so the goal is to find a nice ground state for a given Hamiltonian. So what is a, a wave function? So suppose you have uh, n spins. So uh, every matter is con consisting of uh, many spins. And, and one spin can be thought of as uh, one qubit. So suppose you have n qubits. Then this is a wave function. And you want to find uh, this uh, explicit form of this uh, wave function for a given Hamiltonian. And if Hamiltonian is diag diagonalized, it's easy. So you, you just minimize this energy, which is a multiplication of this Hamiltonian times this psi absolute value squared, uh, summed over all uh, possible uh, spin states. But if Hamiltonian is not diagonalized, then it's difficult, right? So uh, this is the expression for diagonalized Hamiltonian, but in general, it's difficult. So uh, to solve this question, uh, what you have to do is to put an ansatz on this, uh, the shape of this uh, wave function. The, the most popular one is so-called matrix product states. Uh, that is given by this trace of a matrix which depends on the spin for S1, mat matrix A, which depends on this uh, uh, spin S2, blah, 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 and take a trace. So this is the simplest one. And in a graphical uh, 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 sense, uh, this uh, notation can be rephrased in terms of this uh, network. You have spins here, and they are connected by these so-called tensors. This tensor, this uh, uh, triangle one, uh, has three legs, the one, two, and three. And third leg is the, actually this a spin. So this is a matrix, depending on S1, right? And you take a trace. So it means that uh, this leg and the other leg of this other triangle uh, is uh, summed over. So you take a trace. And this matrix product state actually uh, works very nicely because uh, normally in this Hamiltonian, so Hamiltonian is not a generic function of S. Uh, you uh, normally has some uh, translation invariance. So, uh, so because of this translation invariance of this Hamiltonian, uh, these matrices A's uh, could be taken to be the same one, right? And then uh, the, 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 the free parameters uh, for this matrix product state is just the components of this single matrix A. So that reduces hugely the number of free parameters to uh, just the number of components of a single matrix. And this works for some uh, cases, but uh, the other cases, for example, uh, the quantum states on uh, critical matter, uh, uh, this doesn't work. Uh, rather, uh, people invented this kind of form for the, 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 the matrices. So suppose you have uh, four uh, qubits, then uh, the first and second are summed over by this triangle A, and third, fourth uh, triangle A, and this, these legs uh, are summed with a different uh, matrix B. And these are called tensor network states. And this has a different uh, summation uh, structure compared to this matrix product states. And it has more variables. And now, 
the recent developments actually uh, is uh, given uh, just by introducing uh, other networks. So these are neural network states. So the breakthrough was made by Carillo and Troya in 2017. That was uh, Boltzmann machine states. So what is that? So the uh, wave function itself is given by this Boltzmann machine. So on your right, you have a Boltzmann machine. S1, S2, S3, S4, uh, S4 these are visible layer. So this is a visible layer, the visible units. And you have uh, hidden units. So hidden units are thought of uh, uh, some spins which cannot be observed from, uh, from you. And then you assume this kind of very easy Hamiltonian, which is a spin-spin coupling between a uh, visible layer and the hidden layer. And the spin-spin coupling, J, and also A and B, those are biases, uh, thought of as uh, free parameters. And it's on the, on the exponent, because it, this is a Boltzmann weight. So now you uh, 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 optimize these uh, parameters, A, B, and J, to change this uh, wave function and reduce the energy by uh, changing it. And this is the Boltzmann machine states. So uh, uh, the difference from the, uh, other, uh, the previous cases is just that you have a very different uh, network state, and you optimize uh, these parameters. So parameter embedding for this nonlinear function is just different. And of course, you may uh, want to uh, change, uh, so generalize this uh, Boltzmann machine states to a deeper one. So this is a deep Boltzmann machine states. And nice thing about this is that, of course, you can uh, uh, introduce uh, more, uh, more free parameters. So it, uh, we, you expect that uh, it may uh, lower the energy better. Uh, but uh, there is a conceptual uh, uh, difference from uh, this uh, Boltzmann machine states. So in, in this paper, I act, actually, the, uh, the, uh, the Boltzmann machine Hamiltonian is taken to be the same as the Hamiltonian, which is for, yes? Uh, I'm wondering if there's a normalization term that should also be here that is, that is being left out. Yeah, um, of course, and, yes, yes. So uh, psi, psi squared, uh, psi, psi is not, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So no matter what and I know, I know practically with Boltzmann machines, that's often the most challenging part, is not, is not oh, getting the, the, oh, the energy function, but, but Good. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I may ask you more questions <laughs> later. So the difference uh, uh, for this uh, deep, deep Boltzmann machine is that the Hamiltonian taken uh, for the uh, Boltzmann machine here, so normally this is, of course, different from the Hamiltonian which, uh, for, uh, which defines the uh, system and you want to low, make uh, uh, lower energy. But here in deep Boltzmann machine states, uh, this Hamiltonian, the Boltzmann machine Hamiltonian, is taken to be the same as the uh, original Hamiltonian. The reason is that the uh, uh, ground state uh, wave function can be written in terms of, uh, uh, so, so this way, this uh, original Hamiltonian in this way. So you start with any state, and you multiply this exponentiation of tau h, where tau is the imaginary time, and take tau goes to infinity. Then uh, this signals out only the ground state uh, from any uh, wave function, right? And then you discretize this uh, tau into very small terms like this, and then you put, uh, you consider this uh, uh, factorized component as a single layer uh, weights. So in this way, the original Hamiltonian can be mapped to a Boltzmann machine Hamiltonian. And so you see the equivalence between the ground state and this representation quite clearly. So if this is successful completely, then you do, you do not need to tune uh, these parameters because this is the same as the original Hamiltonian. So in this way, these two are related to each other. And of course, uh, you, you, you are familiar with uh, this feed-forward neural network, and you, you can use it to define a wave function. For example, this is feed four. This is uh, input layer, and this is final layer. And uh, feed four is going this way. The uh, S1, S2, S3, F4, uh, S4, these are uh, multiplied by ways, and then uh, uh, activation function. And then you get, uh, for example, the real part of this uh, wave function defined in, by this uh, nonlinear function. Then uh, you optimize this energy by changing these uh, uh, ways. So this is a short list of uh, what we know about neural network states. And in, for, in fact, uh, we know that in some cases, uh, the neural network states beats the conventional ones. So in this original paper by Korea and Troia, uh, they uh, tried two-dimensional anti-ferromagnetic Heisenberg model. 
and uh, this is the plot from their paper. So the horizontal axis is the number of hidden units for this restricted uh, Boltzmann machine states, and the, uh, this is the energy. And then EPS and uh, PEPS PEPs, uh, these are conventional states. And then if you increase the number of hidden units, then uh, the, the uh, Boltzmann machine states can beat the conventional ones. Yes, please. <coughs> Sorry, so Koji, so I think of a tensor network as generally a very quantum thing where you have to worry about entanglement and things like that, and a feed forward network as a classical thing. So, can you just say something about how you're distinguishing classical from quantum and the role of entanglement and that sort of thing? So, uh, you're here about? I don't discuss any entanglement. However, uh, from view, the viewpoint of the, this uh, giving the uh, wave function ansatz, you can just use this uh, feed forward or the tensor network state, whichever you like. Yeah. So you're basically so just taking the, the real part of it and ignoring entanglement. Um, right. So, uh, so, so for, for this case, uh, you, uh, you come up with the two different feed forward neural network. One gives the real part, the other gives the imaginary part. Yeah, in that way. So uh, all these wave functions you're writing down are uh, positive, or at least non-negative, in uh, this preferred basis. Um, so, so for more general Hamiltonians, do you multiply by some chosen sign function or something to get uh, the right um, sign structure? So, so the wave function itself can be negative, of course. It, uh, but so but it the the ansatz you wrote down is 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 a positive. Oh, output. this one, yeah, yes. that's right. So, uh, mm, I don't really know how. Uh, so, uh, so it depends on the system, I think. So it depends on the system which you work for, and sometimes uh, this uh, ansatz may work. Some, so, so this is, uh, uh, of course, a real function, right? And the general wave function is uh, complex. So if this is a real one, can work. Well, well not just real, but it's positive real. Sorry? It's, 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 a, it's a positive real function on the right-hand side that yeah. you wrote down. Yeah. At least a non-negative real yeah. function, I should say. So, uh, so I'd, I'd like to tell you the relation between these things uh, in, in a little more, more detail. So here, uh, so there, there are se several papers which discuss and state that, uh, uh, that there, there is a relation between the, these ansatz. So first of all, uh, the Boltzmann machine states uh, can be regarded as a kind of uh, tensor network states. And also, the, the uh, backward is true. The tensor network states, if it's given, then you can have a deep, deep Boltzmann machine states a representation for it. And also, uh, so, so, uh, so these are possible since, uh, for example, uh, Boltzmann machine uh, is known to have a, a universal approximation theorem. So any, any function can be approximated nicely. And so it should include uh, some kind of uh, tensor network states. However, if you do a mapping from, for example, Boltzmann machine to tensor network states, then uh, typically this tensor network state is very intricate. And so it's very difficult to find uh, what's the physical meaning of this tensor network states. And also, uh, that also, that is also the case for this uh, number two. Uh, if the ten so suppose you have you have tensor network states which are very simple, and you rep uh, you uh, you have its uh, deep Boltzmann machine representation, then this deep Boltzmann machine representation is very complicated. So in this way, these two uh, may be equivalent to each other. However, uh, the way uh, you optimize is very different and also the number of uh, physical uh, free parameters are different. And also one more comment is that the tensor states uh, can be regarded as a kind of feed forward state uh, with uh, a special activation function which is called product pooling. So this is a brief summary of uh, what I know for a quantum matter wave function. These are so, so interesting uh, uh, network ansatz uh, tried and some, in some cases neural network states can beat the conventional uh, states. So let me go on to this, uh, the right-hand side, quantum gravity. So in particular, uh, string theory is, of course, known to be uh, uh, a theory of quantum gra gravity, but it, it, uh, it has a quantization only around flat geometry. And on the other hand, so if you look, up, look back the, uh, the history of quantum gravity, there is a renowned uh, regic calculus. So what is regic calculus? So Reggie proposed how to compute the Einstein action using uh, simplices. 
So suppose you have uh, this kind of two-dimensional Riemann surface. Then you uh, introduce uh, simplices to discretize this surface, and then uh, use this uh, sim simplices to uh, calculate the Einstein action. So one version of it is uh, to count just the number of edges uh, accumulating into a, a point, and then uh, this would give you the curvature. And the original rate calculus means that uh, you measure the, the length of uh, these edges, and then uh, compute the curvature from that. So there are many ways, uh, but uh, in principle, uh, what uh, people, done, uh, people have done is to uh, make a, a, a discrete a discretization of uh, continuous space time in this way and compute the uh, Einstein action. And on the other hand, uh, for these uh, 20 years, uh, we have a nice uh, development in quantum gravity that is uh, based on holographic principle. And this holographic pr principle defines quantum gravity in a, in a way. So what is that? So uh, typically, this kind of picture has been drawn. Uh, now you have CFT, which is uh, nothing but the quantum matter without gravity, and then uh, this quantum matter is uh, uh, claimed to be equivalent to quantum gravity in the bulk, which is in a, a one-dimensional higher space-time. And the typical equation which you expect for uh, this correspondence is this one. This is called gkp witten relation. The left-hand side is a quantum matter partition function. For example, if this is a spin matter, then you can uh, put some magnetic field on it. That is an uh, outer source field that is uh, den denoted as J. And this wave function uh, actually uh, changes depending on this uh, outer source uh, J, which is magnetic field. So the, once this partition function is given, then you can compute everything. So this is the definition of quantum matter. And then holographic principle states that uh, this quantum matter, uh, defined by this partition function, is equivalent to uh, quantum gravity where uh, action for gravity is given, and a matter, uh, so field for gravity is given, phi, and then you make a path integration with a special uh, boundary condition here, which is written here. Then the path integration, which defines the partition function, partition function of quantum gravity, is claimed to be equivalent to uh, quantum matter without gravity partition function. So this is how uh, IDS safety works. But there is no uh, proof on, on, these, on this relation, so it's just a conjecture. And we want to know, for example, how we construct this thing out of a given uh, quantum matter, or what kind of classical geometry is necessary to reproduce the partition function and correlation function of uh, quantum matter. That is unknown. Although it's unknown, uh, recently, uh, there was a progress in uh, defining ADS-CFT in a, as a time model, and these are uh, uh, written in this networking uh, picture. So one, one is uh, so-called ADS-MERA correspondence. MERA is the, a special uh, tensor network states, and in these tensor network states, you uh, accumulate uh, these uh, uh, special kinds of tensors to have a hyperbolic space. So this direction is our spin space, so our space, space time. And this direction is a network space. And now you reduce the number of uh, uh, tensors like this. Then uh, because of the reduction of the number of tensors, uh, this uh, tensor network <coughs> space looks like a hyperbolic space. And the hyperbolic space is a special time slice of uh, anti-dojita space. So, uh, so uh, Swingo um, uh, claimed that uh, this would be an ADS safety correspondence just by looking at uh, this uh, uh, tensor network uh, uh, connection uh, space. And also recently uh, by Pastowski, Yoshida, Haron, Reskill, uh, they invented a nice uh, network states for a, uh, for a toy model of ADS-CFT. So in this picture, the surrounding circle here is a space of spin. So there are many spins uh, aligned on this circle. And the inside of that is the bulk space-time, which is for quantum gravity. And now uh, they prepared uh, this special uh, tensor, which is called perfect tensor. It is a generalization of unitary matrix. And because of the, the unitarity of this uh, tensor, special tensor, you can push the information in the bulk onto the boundary, uh, which is uh, quantum matter. So in this way, the equivalence between this uh, uh, quantum matter states and the bulk states can be assured in this toy model. So these are very nice toy models. 
uh, the, the, the bad part about this is that uh, we don't know what is the uh, propagating quantum gravity, gravity degrees of freedom. And also, the space time is complete, completely fixed to be anti dosita space. So if you want to have a more generic geometry, uh, out, out, so which should emerge from a given partition function uh, for the spin uh, quantum matter, then we don't know how to do that. On the other hand, this red calculus is based on dynamical triangulation of the space time. And this picture and those pictures, as a picture, they look very similar. However, the concepts are very different. And one, one goal of uh, quantum gravity may be to uh, unify these uh, two kinds of pictures. Uh, one has a good uh, uh, advantage in, uh, on the basis of ADS safety correspondence, which has been explored quite much. On the other hand, we have uh, this uh, uh, dynamical triangulation picture of space time. And uh, so a combination of these two would be important. So one thing uh, to state, the similarity between holographic principle and the uh, neural network is this. So this is the picture which I, I, I suggested. And uh, it's an equivalence between the partial function of uh, quantum matter and quantum gravity. On the other hand, this is a, a, a well-known uh, equation for the Boltzmann machine. So I draw this picture in, uh, in a sideway down. So this direction is a deeper direction. You have many hidden layers. And this is the visible layer. <laughs> The visible layer has uh, uh, the visible units who, who take, which take the value of vi. And the summation over uh, all the invisible units uh, give you this probability distribution for a uh, given input vi. So when you look at this equation, then they look very similar. So first, uh, the visible layer given here is a quantum material, material uh, partition function, which we know. But uh, this part, we don't know. And then, uh, if we want to uh, reproduce this uh, distribution, uh, uh, a probability distribution for given V, then you come up with uh, some optimized uh, network weights. And if you can interpret this network as a kind of space time here, then you have a nice dictionary between these two. So, so this is just a similarity in between these two. And if you want to make more precise, make it more precise, this, then this energy function needs to reproduce this gravity action. And that part would be very difficult. However, uh, so based on this uh, kind of uh, mapping, uh, you can use the deep learning technique to optimize the space time and get a special metric function which reproduce uh, this quantum material uh, partition function. So uh, I'd like to discuss this thing more with, with you. So if you're interested in, uh, please come to this breakout group uh, this afternoon. Uh, which will be uh, led by Izwan and myself. OK, so I come to, so how many minutes do I have? 15. 15, thanks. So briefly, I explain how I can map holography and deep learning, and then come to an application, or, or rather to say prediction. So what is the wishes to use neural network for matter and gravity? So machine learning may be good because uh, many, many network answers has been proposed. Optimization of network parameters is possible. And also, it's known that it can uh, solve inverse problems. And we know from the history of Galileo that uh, solving inverse problems uh, may lead to physical revolutions. So uh, why not? We, we, use, uh, emergent, we use neural network for uh, getting an emergent about space time for a given matter partition function. So what is the inverse problem for the case of holographic principle? So this is the normal problem. And I will explain what is the, uh, what's the difficulty of inverse problem. For normal problem, uh, we have Einstein action. Then we have some uh, specific metric. And if you use holographic principle, then this gives you uh, what is the quantum matter. Okay? So quantum matter is here. Then you treat this as a prediction for the model of this given metric. Then you can compare those with some experimental data for quantum material. So this is the modeling, holographic modeling of quantum matter. But the question is uh, how you get this metric. So this metric is necessary for uh, defining the model. But we don't know how to define this, uh, how, how to get the proper metric which can be well compared with the experimental data. So now, 
If I use deep learning, then uh, using this experimental data and go backwards, and then uh, you can actually compute the metric here. Then use this metric to uh, predict other physical observables and then compare that with experimental data. So this is a way you can use uh, deep learning for uh, holographic modeling of quantum matter. So for spe spe specific example, uh, I'll tell you later. So in uh, particle physics community, we have uh, a community of uh, lattice QCD, and that uh, has uh, that uses supercomputer to solve uh, qu uh, quantum chrome dynamics uh, of quarks and gluons. And this is one data which comes from supercomputer. So quark mass versus so-called chiral condensate. This is the most important physical observable in QCD. And then this is a graph for fixed temperature. And then I use this for experimental data and then use this to fix the emergent metric in holography. And then I compute other observables like uh, quark interquark potential and compare that with uh, some other uh, supercomputer results. Yes? For uh, those who may not be aware in the audience, could you maybe describe a little bit about QCD, why it's on a lattice, why okay. it's an interesting sure, problem, sure, et cetera? Sure. Yes. So QCD has a definite Lagrangian. So it has an equation of motion for quarks. So it's a system for quarks and gluons. Those are elementary particles. And although we know uh, the equation of motion, we don't know what is the quantum states. So, okay. So Hamiltonian is given, but we don't know what is the quantum states. So what people do is to use supercomputer to make the, this uh, path integral for all possible states, then uh, evaluate the physical observables like this uh, uh, chiral condensate, and then compare that with the experiments, okay? the real experiments. So here the hope is uh, to get a nice uh, model, a gravity model, uh, which can reproduce all of these uh, supercomputer results. And to, to do that, you, you need to have, uh, invent some new uh, nice uh, metric which will produce these results. Okay. Jim, do you think that this is, yeah, not sufficient, but. <laughs> so let me proceed. So this is uh, uh, one slide uh, summary of what is uh, ADS-CFD or holography. So please uh, bear in mind. So what you do is very simple. You do just uh, solving the classical equation of motion in curved geometry, and that's it. So uh, I consider a classical scalar field in uh, five-dimensional curved space-time. The space-time metric is given here. So f and g, these are the functions uh, which, space, uh, which determine the curved space-time, or ADS space-time. And we don't know what is f and what is g. But uh, for given f and g, you can compute this uh, action and you can compute the equation of motion. So in holography, there are two boundary conditions for f and g. So for eta is infinity, so this eta is the radial direction of ADS. Uh, f and g should uh, behave like this exponential. And uh, on the other hand, at eta is equal to zero, there is a black hole horizon where f and g goes like this. So if you solve the uh, second order differential equation for for this uh, field phi, uh, whose variable is eta, then uh, of course it's second order differential equation, so there are two uh, solutions, e to the minus eta and e to the minus three eta around ADS boundary here. And the coefficient of these two uh, in holographic principle relates to uh, the uh, physical observable in the background fields. So MQ is a quark mass in the case of QCD, and this is a chiral condensate. Chiral condensate is a function of a quark mass. So uh, this is the most important quantity in lattice QCD. And this uh, relation between these two are encoded in the coefficient of these uh, solutions of uh, differential equation given by this uh, background metric. So these two are independent, uh, since these, these two are independent solutions. However, and on the other side of this geometry, eta equals to zero, these two may be related by this boundary condition. So there are two boundary conditions here, and that relates to coefficients. And this uh, relation between two coefficients gives you the partition function of the quantum material. Okay? So I want to implement uh, these, these things in a, a neural network by uh, assuming that the neural network itself is space-time. So how do I do that? So uh, first, I start with the, this uh, equation of motion. This is the equation of motion for scalar field phi. And the background metric, the curved geometry, is encoded into this single function, h. 
And now you discretize this eta direction and make this second order differential equation to first order, like Hamilton, Hamilton form. Then you get uh, one equation for defining pi, which is a derivative of phi. And then also the, the evolution equation for pi that is equivalent to this equation. So in this form, uh, in, in fact, this uh, uh, continuous uh, second order differential equation is uh, now mapped to uh, this neural network, where these green lines are the weights uh, which correspond to this H, since uh, this is phi and H, so a two-story house. And this H comes in the evolution equation of pi to pi, so it, it is encoded here. And the other weights are completely fixed by this equation. So this is a sparse neural network with unknown coefficient uh, uh, h, which is a background metric, is now a neural network like this. And this direction of eta, which is the uh, ADS radial direction, is the uh, network width uh, direction. So by using uh, this uh, uh, mapping uh, from uh, ADS safety holographic principle to deep learning, I can solve the, uh, uh, the problem in holographic principle uh, to get this gravity metric by using deep learning. Okay. So in section two, that is the final section, I, I will demonstrate how I do that. So this is a picture of which I try. So from experimental data, which is a chiral condensate versus quark mass, you get metric by uh, identifying the metric as a neural network weight. Then uh, compute uh, some other physical observables using this metric to uh, compare with other uh, experimental data. So first, uh, from this data, I pick up only this, uh, the, the fixed temperature data this, that is uh, this black line. So there are only four points, and four points are not enough to uh, train my neural network. So I generate uh, many data from this uh, just single line with the uh, error bar uh, considered. So these uh, br blue dots are positive data, and uh, red dots are negative data. So I use this. And then neural network is this. So this is a neural network, where uh, green, green lines are, again, these are weights which are to be trained, which are trained, and those uh, give you the, uh, uh, the emergent uh, space time. So using this QCD data, I, I, can I, uh, I can optimize this neural network to get uh, this H. So this is a movie. So the initial condition for this uh, H of eta is a zigzag, so it's randomly generated. And then with this randomly generated data uh, uh, metric, uh, so these green dots are points which were, uh, which were uh, computed as a positive data. And of course, it is wrong, since the, the true positive data is here. So the machine tries to uh, change this uh, uh, metric so that uh, these uh, positive data, judged positive data, uh, matches uh, the real positive data. And here is a movie of how the machine optimizes. So in this way, amazingly, uh, a certain metric is emergent. And uh, with this emergent metric, the computed positive data actually matches the, the uh, lattice QCD data nicely. And also, some other uh, uh, free parameters can be also trained like this, depending on your model. And then you use uh, this uh, uh, obtained metric, which has a strange shape, strange shape like this. There is a bump here. I don't know why. This could be a quantum gravity effect. But uh, using this metric, you can uh, calculate other observables uh, by using holographic principle, for example, quark anti quark potential. Uh, the potential energy versus the quark anti quark distance can be calculated using this emergent metric. And then you compare that with uh, lattice QCD data. So this is a supercomputer result for QCD. And if you look at that, then there is a, a horizontal part, and there is a linear part, and also there is a Coulomb part like this. And it's amazing to me because in every uh, holographic model which has been invented so far, did not reproduce this one. And this uh, nicely trained metric, actually, I don't know why it reproduces uh, all the features of this uh, QCD. 
So this is one example which, uh, which, is, uh, which I, I thought that is very good to assume that space-time is a neural network and use this uh, interpretation of ways to be identical to the metric of the space-time can work well. Yes, please. Any assumptions about the bulk potential? The bulk potential for this field phi? Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> so it, de it depends on your model. So in my case, I chose only a phi 4 potential uh, for this potential part. So that's like an assumption about the bulk right, dual right, right. that you have to make. Yes, yes. And also uh, for, for getting this uh, uh, smooth metric, I need to implement, of course, a regularization of uh, this optimization, and that regularization is the Einstein action. So in this way, how, how you re regularize this and how, what kind of potential you need is a model-dependent thing. I see. So like how much of the final features you found on the next slide, like the nice picture? Mm. Yeah, so how much does that shape depend on those assumptions? Like, for example, if I use like phi to the 6 or... Um, so uh, we haven't tried that. Yeah, okay. This is the simplest uh, trial. But if I use uh, so different regularization things, then the result would be very different. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, question. Um, are you getting a unique metric out of this, or how much does the metric change depending on uh, initializations? Or the training? Okay, thank you for your question. So here, uh, the metric which we obtained is almost unique for given uh, for given fixed model and fixed uh, regularization. Yeah. So we trained uh, this uh, neural network many many times, and the result was the same. Yeah. Different initializations. Different initializations. Yes. yes. So, the, so this is the end of my talk, and the final comment is that, uh, so my message is uh, we may regard this uh, kind of sparse neural network as a space-time, and there uh, we have a very nice physical intuition to interpret how things are going on the neural network. And one thing which I demonstrated is to uh, solve the inverse problem for holography by interpreting this emergent metric as a neural network sparse weights. But uh, there are many things which uh, need to be clarified. For example, uh, so what kind of condition is necessary to take a continuum limit of a given neural network? And in what cases uh, it could be a differential equation? Or uh, in physical systems, of course, we need also uh, locality, uh, causality, and unitarity. And those conditions should be uh, met with the neural architecture of neural networks. And also the symmetries of the neural networks should be very important since uh, uh, physical equations are based on uh, symmetry principle, as uh, Taco Cohen uh, explained uh, this morning. And also, in, uh, if you further want to go to quantum gravity, then non-trivial topology or singularity or horizon structure may arise in neural network, and that would be a good question. And also, uh, the final frontier would be a dynamical network. OK, thank you very much. Before we get to the broader questions, I actually have two quick ones uh, related to this uh, QQ bar potential. Mm -hmm. um, the first question is, could you maybe describe those couple of different phases and sort of how they're sort of classic QCD results? And also this flattening off of the potential, is there any, has anyone gotten that outside of the lattice or is it just this in the lattice? Um, yeah, so, so this uh, flat part is a so-called device screening where uh, quarks are separated from each other. Then at the finite temperature, the force between, between two can be screened by the gluon uh, plasma. So, uh, so this part is uh, typical for finite temperature QCD, and it can be also obtained by many other phenomenological models. Yeah. And this linear part is called uh, confinement. So quarks are known to be confined in uh, hadrons. And if you uh, make it uh, separated from each other, then the, for the constant force between these two uh, uh, in, uh, act. And this part is uh, confinement. And so in uh, uh, holographic models, uh, as far as I know, there is no uh, good uh, coexistence of these two uh, phases. And that is the most important part of this figure. Thanks. Thank you. All right, questions? Um, so uh, as you all well know, in ADS-CFT, 
if you just fix the temperature at the boundary, I can have a black hole phase or also a phase without a black hole. And then there's the Hawking page transition between mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So and do you see that Hawking page transition here? Or can you interpret that? Or are you always in a high temperature limit? Um, so yeah, that's a very important question. So uh, whether we have this uh, first order phase transition or not depends on you, uh, whether you take large end limit for the quantum matter or not, right? So in QCD, if you take large end limit, then uh, you have a hogging page transition. But here, uh, since I use the QCD, lattice QCD data, which has a finite n, so nc is equal to 3, so it would uh, correspond to some quantum gravity, which doesn't have a hogging page transition, right? So here, uh, yeah, so I, 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 I have one comment. So here, uh, if you have just a, 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 a ADS Schwarzschild black hole, then this uh, metric, so this is a volume factor, it goes straight down to zero. But this trained metric has uh, this bump structure. This bump would uh, mean that it wants want to go up, that is confining geometry, but it's not. So this is a coexistence of a black hole phase and a hard wall phase, and that has been somehow trained automatically in this neural network. Okay. So if you're not in the large end limit, then why do you only use the Einstein-Hilbert action as the regulator? Because in ADS-CFT, you would require the large end limit to only use gravity, otherwise I need all the string That's corrections. Right. That's right. So the reason why we use it is that uh, uh, so we don't know uh, some other regulator. And also, uh, if, if, if you don't take strictly the, uh, the classical gravity limit, so h bar is finite in this case, since the regularization of hyperparameter is finite. So, uh, this you, uh, so, so this allows you to you know, deviate from the classical solution of Einstein equation. Um, since you have the bulk metric, can you infer something about the bulk stress tensor from from that? Yeah, um, like checking its energy equation. conditions or something like that. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so uh, when when I first look at uh, this uh, strange uh, bump, then I assume that uh, this will violate some uh, uh, energy conditions. <coughs> but uh, if you want to derive energy condition, then you need to assume Einstein equation, right? So uh, so here I expect that the Einstein equation does not hold. So I don't get any uh, energy condition. That, that is the first comment. And the second comment is that even if I assume Einstein equation, then uh, this, uh, this combination of the metric uh, doesn't show up in any energy condition. So, uh, so uh, this neural network fixes on only the volume factor, volume element. But uh, if you have more data, then that can fix, uh, that can determine every component of the metric, then you can actually uh, make sure that the energy condition is satisfied or not. Thanks. Hi, I'm just wondering uh, to what extent does this method generalize to the case where I don't have a high degree of symmetry in the in the metric? Because it seems like in ANSAS there is some sort of a spherical symmetry, but sure, yeah. sure, sure. That's uh, that's I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So uh, my metric is actually a, a gauge fixed form. So I chose uh, this special gauge where the uh, eta eta component is one. Right? So it's gauge fixed. And also, I assumed a homogeneous metric. So uh, in, in generic cases, uh, maybe you need to generalize this to convolutional neural network. And uh, uh, or also, you, you, you train with the different gauges and compare them uh, independently, whether the physical observable can match with each other or not. Yeah, that's what I, I can do, but other things I don't know. So if I understand correctly, uh, at least for the second half of the talk, the way you're using a neural network is kind of to like learn a differential equation. Yes. Yeah. So just as a comment, like in the last year, there's been all this rage about neural ODEs. So yeah. uh, have you have you tried that? Not yet. Not okay. Yet. Yeah. 
I, I think, uh, yeah, so here, uh, one comment is that, uh, so uh, we usually use uh, this uh, second order differential equation, the partial differential equation. But uh, they can be decomposed into a set of first order. And uh, uh, if you assume homogeneity, then uh, it will go to ODE, right? So in that special case, I, I think uh, we can use that uh, heavily. But uh, one, one necessity is to generalize that to partial differential equations. I can, I can get down <laughs> uh, A similar comment uh, as Greg. So instead of thinking of space time as the depth, uh, isn't it more natural to regress the solution of the PD or the ODE directly? So regress the solution after five seconds uh, if, if eta is time, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. what you will see a lot of other machine learning people do. I think, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. So if we can uh, deal with the uh, uh, PD and optimize the parameters uh, so that I, uh, such that I, I can actually reproduce all the data which is goes, which appears at the boundary, then if there is a way, then that would be uh, the perfect one. But uh, here I thought that, uh, so this was done before this uh, uh, neural ODE. And uh, what I know about neural network was uh, to use backpropagation to optimize all of these things. So I uh, was forced to put my uh, differential equation system into this system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so if you say that uh, PDE or ODE, uh, you can train uh, the parameters appearing in uh, those uh, differential equations uh, naturally, then I think definitely that's better. Just, just checking my understanding. Your, your network, your neural network architecture is fixed. Yes. Right. So the different metrics correspond to different hyperparameters in all parameters in your uh, architecture. I was just wondering what would correspond to change in your actual architecture. I see. So here, the architecture for this uh, double story, uh, it is de defined by this uh, differential equation, right? And also, of course, you can change the number of layers. And those are uh, at, your, at your favor, right? So in our case, I worked with uh, this 15-layer uh, case so, so to, to make sure that uh, actually the metric is trained. But uh, of course, you want to make uh, more layers to make it precise. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's up to you. And the nodes themselves are you know, some, some what kind of functions for each node? Like um, so uh, once you fix the, uh, the, the, this uh, potential function, mm -hmm. V, like a 5-4 potential, then it gives you the definition of the activation function. I see. That's interesting. Thank you. All right. If there are no further questions, let's thank Koji one more time. Thank you very much.